Welcome back to Content Cathedral. This is part three of the story development series. Today, we will delve deep into reader psychology to discover what story really is. Then we will touch on the different writing styles between pantsers and plotters. And we will rough in the four main stages of your novel. In critique, a writer often hears, that story just doesn't work for me. A group of readers will usually agree when a story is somehow wrong. Experiments have shown that even small children, just establishing their verbal skills, have a sense of when a story is incomplete or wrong. Telling the writer how to fix what is wrong is an entirely different matter and may require a professional. But even novice writers will usually agree when a story hits the mark or not. That's why beta readers are so crucial. Having a concept of story so deeply ingrained indicates the rudiments of story have been with us a very long time. Probably as long as language has been with us. Story is written deep in our genetic code and lives in our collective subconscious. That's why it touches us so deeply and can alter our worldview and our behavior. In Techniques of a Selling Writer, Dwight Swain crawls deep into the human psyche to unveil why readers need to read and why some books succeed and others fail. If you were a caveman and your buddy Garth was just eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, you probably realize that doesn't bode well for your survival either. Garth's tight-knit group probably suffered many demoralizing losses. Anyone who knows group dynamics knows demoralized groups function poorly. So as Garth's spot around the fire remains empty, what can a storyteller do to change the group dynamic? The storyteller can make Garth's death seem less random and your existence more purposeful. Is the universe so random and cruel? Who can say? But even today, the world appears to be a dangerous and random place. This causes humans a great deal of psychological suffering. It does not seem fair that you can do everything right in your life and then die some awful death anyway. Though we would like to think of ourselves as all important, we are small, insignificant creatures in the great scheme of the universe. This conflict causes us tension. We are the center of our own little world, but every day we question our own self-worth. Is the world really any different because you are in it? We yearn to be told that continuing the fight is worth it, that we are worthy. We crave the power to control our destiny and not just be the victims of a hostile, random universe. We want security, the security of knowing our behavior has some meaning. We crave a universe that demonstrates justice. So readers turn to stories to make the world appear as though it has order, some reason and logic behind the good and the bad. A strong plot gives the illusion that the world operates with some sort of ironic justice. And in the end, that is a great purpose because it keeps human society together and functional. But that still leaves us with the question, what is this mysterious order that creates story? My favorite definition came from James Scott Bell. Robert McGee, who wrote the book Story, defines it this way. Story is a selection of events from the character's life that is composed into strategic sequence to arouse specific emotions and to express a specific view of life. Philip Girard, who wrote Writing a Book That Makes a Difference, says story is the arc of movement through time and space that translates the action of characters into meaning. He goes on to say, story is a character whom we care about, who acts to gain what he or she desires. Other characters and forces oppose the fulfillment of the desire, and the outcome produces important consequences, and something is irrevocably changed. In fulfilling the task of creating a story effect, some people prefer to let their deeply ingrained genetic code lead the way. They just write, with minimal or no plan. 
These people who fly by the seat of their pants are sometimes called pantsers. You're like the hare in the proverbial race. I have some quick advice for you, and I will turn you loose. Just realize you will have to do more work in the editing mode, the second draft phase. And at that point, the tortoise will catch up to you and may even pass you. On the other hand, some writers stare at the blank page and their minds become equally blank. Don't panic. Likely, you are a plotter. You need a clear, concise plan so you can know what to write next. Great. That's what this whole series is about. By the end, you will have a plan for what to write every day. No more being bullied by that bright white sheet. But life is rarely absolute for any of us. The vast majority of us are neither pantsers or plotters. We are somewhere in the middle. Most of us plan a little way ahead and write toward a certain story event. When they get close to that point, they plan a little further or a little more in detail. These writers who start with a vague plan or only plan as far ahead as they need to to keep on writing, I call headlighters. And they are by far the largest group of writers. If you're a pantser, you're more in touch with your subconscious already. And you probably have an innate sense of story. Here is my advice before I turn you loose with the idea you developed in session one. Buy writing open the mind and devour it. Do all of the exercises. Follow your muse, no matter where it leads you. Don't be afraid. There may be some blind alleys, but mostly the muse will be well behaved if you listen to her. Write Write and write some more. Download Write or Die and work up as much time as you can and as many words as you can in the time allowed. Writing fast helps you to get to the subconscious. Tickle your subconscious. Write longhand instead of on your keyboard and see if new ideas come that way. Write in different places and at different times of day. Concentrate mostly on developing your characters. Let them determine your plot. Give them free range, and you will be surprised what they accomplish on their own. Follow along with the plotters on this blog. You don't have to do the exercises, but plot theory is something you will eventually have to address, and you should have a working knowledge of how the elements of story interact to create plot. Plotters, the rest of this program, is all about you. Do the exercises and it should lead to easy writing. Headlighters, you have to do everything the plotters and the pantsers are doing at the same time or alternately. I want to discuss one other thing before we leave the plots and pants discussion. Let's say you are all the way over on the pantser side and the thought of plotting makes you queasy. What if you did it anyway? Maybe not with your best idea, or even your second best, but maybe that fourth or fifth best idea. Now, why would you want to do that? When I was younger, I learned to play the guitar. Like most creative ventures, playing music takes creativity and a whole lot of practice. No one thinks you can play a song on a guitar without practice. And let's face it, your fourth or fifth idea probably won't get used to write a masterpiece. You'll have more, better ideas by the time you've used up ideas one through three. Why not use idea number four for practice? Plotting practice will seep into your subconscious like muscle memory does for someone learning to play an instrument. It will make it more likely that what you free write has ingrained structure, even though it isn't intentionally plotted. Same goes for you way over on the plotter side of the spectrum. Why not take the fourth and fifth idea that you aren't planning to develop further and free write with that idea for 20 minutes every morning? 20 minutes isn't that much time to lose in a day, and you can use it to warm yourself up for the real story that you are writing. Do the counting backwards from 20 exercise we did in episode one. Then just see where the character takes you. Stretch those subconscious muscles, and your real writing is likely to be more imaginative and original as a result. 
Now let's move on to creating that satisfying feeling for your reader. Because your reader is seeking comfort to balm the tensions and dangers of his or her real life, your character must also face and overcome some danger. She must prove that she deserves to win against her challenges before you can give her a just reward. That gives the illusion to the reader that all is really right with the world. And if they are good people in the long run, they will be rewarded too. The setup introduces this danger and arouses the reader's curiosity so they want to read further. By the end of the setup, the main character's life has been disrupted, causing him to seek some new goal. The goal must have some moral weight. The main character's principles, convictions, need to be challenged by this goal. The stakes of failing to achieve this goal must be made clear to the reader, and the reader must sympathize with this character to create emotional tension in the reader. That tension is caused by some nagging question the reader has to answer by reading further. Another name for this original story question is the hook. Along the way, this section also has to establish the setting, the genre, and who or what opposes the character or antagonizes them. In the response phase, the main character explores her, her options. She may even attempt to solve the problem, but her own character flaws prevent her from being successful. This builds the tension for the reader. The original goal may be achieved only to find a bigger goal must now be obtained. For example, a mother finds drugs in her daughter's backpack. She goes to the child's room to discuss what she found with her daughter. The initial goal is to have a discussion with her daughter. When the mother opens the door to the teen's room, the girl is gone and the window is open. Now the mother has a new, much bigger goal. See how that works? The attack phase begins when the main character realizes she will have to change in order to achieve her goal. The true depth of consequences of failure are also revealed to the main character, so she cannot give up and walk away, though she would really like to do so. Others in the story may come to the main character's aid, but it is the main character that has to achieve this goal. The tension is built and focused to a sharp peak called the climax. The final phase, resolution, releases the tension and gives the reader the reward they have been seeking while enduring all the buildup of tension. An evolved main character acts heroically to solve her problem, proving her worth. Remember, the main character must do the work here, so that the main character appears to be the master over his or her fate. Nothing can come to the main character's aid at the last second. It has to be something the main character has done that rescues the day. If the character has acted in accord with her conviction, then she is given a reward. It is not necessarily the material goal the character was seeking, but ultimately it is a symbolic reward for the moral dilemma the character has conquered. If the character has failed her convictions, then the novel may be noir, and the character should be symbolically punished. It is the universe doling out karmic justice that gives readers the release of tension that they seek. You may have noticed that many of the labels we give story are quite similar to the labels used by Masters and Johnson to describe human sexual response. The response of a reader to a satisfying story is in some way similar to satisfying sex. The novel that is right for the reader leaves him relaxed and satisfied. A novel that ends wrong leaves him tense and disappointed. Not unlike being teased by a lover when there is no reward in sight. The moral of this presentation, don't be a story tease. Your homework is to do the second exercise in the Snowflake Developer. If you are using the Scrivener template, I changed it a little, so either download it again or just copy and paste the Word version into your copy of the template, and then remember to save it. Next time, we will look at the four stages of story from a slightly different angle.
we will use Dan O'Bannon's conflict analysis to further define the stages of your story. If you have stumbled across Content Cathedral by accident and are not a member, you can become a member by emailing me at authorcalexsmith at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and I hope to see you at the Hangout.